So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of Chess and Intuitive Surgical, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar presentation on improving diagnostic yield in small nodules with shape sensing, bronchoscopy, uh, shape sensing robotic bronchoscopy. Uh, I am George Chang, Medical Director of Interventional Pulmonology at the UCSD. Thank you for joining us today for a terrific, terrific conversation. Uh, my first guest today is Dr. Gerald Kreiner, who is the Chair and Professor of Thoracic Medicine and Surgery at Lewis Cass School of Medicine at Temple University and Director of Temple Lung Center. Uh, welcome and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And my next guest is Dr. Moet Chala, uh, who is the Chief of Pulmonary Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Chala, thank you for joining us today. And a uh, couple of housekeeping items before we start. Uh, please note, uh, we'll have our uh, audience on mute during the presentation. And please submit your questions on the chat box or Q&A. Uh, we'll address them at the end of the presentation. The flow of the conversation will, uh, uh, will be as such. Dr. Kreiner will start with the current challenges and data uh, on EMN modalities. Next, Dr. Trala will provide an uh, introduction to ion robotic bronchoscopy, followed by several illustrative cases from his experiences. Uh, and finally, Dr. Kreiner will conclude with several of his cases uh, that will be also illuminating uh, for all of us. Um, so Dr. Kreiner, please take it away. Thanks, George, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So thanks for the opportunity to be able to present on giving a background review of the current challenges and data on the different EMN modalities that we have to diagnose patients with lung cancer. Next slide, Abby. So why are we here? This slide, I think, shows it uh, in the most concise way. It's because of lung cancer. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in uh, both men and women. There's approximately a quarter of a million new cases per year, and there's 135,000 deaths per year. This works out to be one patient dies of lung cancer in the United States about every four minutes. Next slide. Now, the reason why lung cancer is so deadly is because we traditionally have diagnosed it at a later stage. As you can see from the data the U.S. population from 2009 to 2015, patients presented at a later stage 57% of the time, distant stage. And as you can see, the five-year survival is abysmal at less than 3% when patients present at the advanced stages. Next slide. But lung cancer screening has been shown to make a difference. And as you can see from the NLST, data and as well as the Nelson data that was recently published overall, we can change the stage and improve patient survival if we diagnose lung cancer and treat it at earlier stages. And as you can see from the prior slide, that we go from 50% plus patients presenting at a distant stage to 50% of patients present at an early stage when lung cancer screening is used. And both the NLST as well as the Nelson study showed we can improve survival by about 20%. Next slide. Now, the opportunities to improve lung cancer's um, diagnosis in an earlier stage is, presents a tremendous leap forward in our ability to improve patients' outcome, but it also presents challenges. The majority of the studies that look at lung cancer screening show that small per, uh, solitary peripheral nodules are malignant about one to 12% of the time NLST data was about 2.5 to 5.2 percent overall. And size matters. If a lesion is less than two centimeters in size, our diagnostic yield is about half of what it is if it's greater than two centimeters. So 33 versus 62 percent diagnostic yields. However, fluoroscopic guidance and the bronchial ultrasound, electromagnetic navigation, can all help improve sensitivity. In peripheral lung lesions overall, EMB technologies has shown an increase in diagnostic yield from a range of 59 to 74% in clinical trials of experienced users. Next slide. Well, this is data from the Nelson study. It was in a blue journal that looks at where, in a Nelson trial, where the solitary peripheral nodules were found. And as one can see, they're mainly in the outer third, and they're also in the apical regions of both the upper lobe and lower lobes. 
So these are somewhat diagnostic challenges for using conventional bronchoscopy. Next slide. And there's some factors besides the size of the lesion and the lobe uh, where it's located and where it's in the outer third versus the central third of the lung. Is the lesion endoluminal? Is it prox what's the proximity to the airway? Is it within two, three centimeters or more distant than that? Is a bronchus side pre uh, sign present? And what is the orientation of the lesion to the distal end of the scope? Is it concentric or eccentric overall? All these factors can affect our diagnostic yield. Next slide. So this is really what the gold standard is for diagnosis right now in the United States. The use of CT-guided peripheral biopsy, transthoracic needle aspirate. Its diagnostic yield for lesions that are less than two centimeters is about 92%. However, it carries the morbidity of going through the pleura and causing a pneumothorax 24 to 38% of the time, whether an FNA or a core biopsy is needed. And that results in the need for chest tube placement, almost 6% of patients overall. Contrast that with flexible bronchoscopy with EM, EMB or EMN, the diagnostic yield is about 20% lower at 73%, and a pneumothorax rate is half, but it's still about 3% of the patients will need an intervention. Next slide. So there's clearly room for us to move with bronchoscopy to improve the diagnostic yield and be a more safer opportunity for the patient. Well, if you look at what impact EMN has had over the last five years, if you look at Medicare data overall, it hasn't done much to erode into the number of patients that are getting TTNA with CT guidance. You can see it still remains at 59% in 2015 compared to 2010. And there is less people getting conventional bronchoscopy and more getting uh, uh, bronchoscopy guided with EMB, EMB. That's almost quadruple from two to 9%, but it hasn't eroded into the need for TTNA. And if you look at lesions less than two or greater than two centimeters as reported in the meta-analysis by Wang Namoli, we're at the 61 to 83% range based on size of the lesion. Again, skilled users. But if we go into a more broadened group of, uh, of practitioners using it and look at the acquire registry overall, our yields are much lower, 47% less than two centimeters, 53% greater than two centimeters. So this raises the next question. Do we have technology that we can broaden this that more people can get treated closer to home in their community? Next slide. So overall, this is the landscape that exists right now in the United States to diagnose patients with lung cancer and arrive at our endpoint to treat them. You can see that patients with SPNs can be diagnosed by LDCT, or they can be found incidentally on other imaging changes. And then they go to their GP, and there's a little bit of a <clears throat> football passed in between the pulmonologist to the interventional radiologist, or from the pulmonologist to the, um, uh, the uh, interventional pulmonologist who does advanced bronchoscopy. Next slide. So this overall leads to a delay from when patients are recognized to have a small peripheral nodule, maybe lung cancer, to the diagnosis until the patient eventually gets treatment. Next slide. So overall, our job with using these new modalities is try to streamline this pathway so we can come to effect, effective and safer diagnosis and eventual treatment of our patients. So next. Mohit Chala, who's the Chief of Pulmonary Services at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, is going to talk about improving the diagnostic yield in small nodules with shape sensing, robotic bronchoscopy, and how to use strategies to uh, be successful in peripheral bronchoscopy. Mohit? Great, Gerard. Thank you very much. Thanks for that wonderful background. Um, next slide, please. I won't go into the problems that are related to um, the lung nodule, as he just outlined, but what you can see here is that we have to deal with some small airways to get to these nodules. We have to establish a diagnosis and eventually a treatment. So in the range of about five millimeters is what our tools need to be. Um, so you could see a variety of standard bronchoscopes there on the top right. As you get smaller to achieve that diameter you need, you also lose your working channel. Next slide. So conventional bronchoscopy has a lot of cons. The things that we need are a steerable device that can help you localize the tumor, visualize the tumor, maintain that positioning, as well as provide real-time sampling. 
some of the pros of bronchoscopy is a low risk profile. We could sample multiple lesions and of course, concurrent lymph node staging. On the other hand, percutaneous, and we won't go through all the details, helps solve some of those problems, but then brings in its own problems as has just been outlined. For really any bronchoscopy procedure, it is all about the planning. Spend more time with your CAT scan than you do doing the procedure. That's being a little bit extreme, but the point is spend a lot of time with your CAT scan. You'll know what you need to do before you get into the room. And of course, operator experience is key here. Next slide. So this is just one example. Uh, this is not yet talking about robotic bronchoscopy, uh, but one example of planning and spending time with your CAT scan. This is a left upper lobe lung nodule uh, that sort of straddled the anterior segment and the lingula, not just the parenchyma, but bronchi from each led to that nodule, which you could see in the uh, coronal section on the top right there. And because we planned ahead, we knew that one airway was gonna be a little bit trouble and the other airway is gonna be a little bit better. And that's sort of um, solidified here uh, on the radial levis images on the bottom. You see one's an eccentric view and one's a concentric view. The point is planning, 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 and you'll choose your correct path. Next slide. So there are some sort of analog tools that are out there to help us uh, achieve some of the uh, factors needed to overcome conventional bronchoscopy, whether it's a guide sheath, we just looked at radial EBIS, using a cure right or some other steerable tool. The, these are, again, I use the word analog not so loosely. They're not great. They're only gonna help you achieve solutions in some situations, clearly not going to be the game changer that we need. Next slide. Here's an example of using thin bronchoscopy to get out to a lesion. Again, this was all about planning, but it's also about patient selection. Uh, you, if you look at just this one case, it looks like we, we, we solved our problems. This is still, number one, not a peripheral or subpleural lesion. And two, uh, this is an experienced bronchoscopist who, who tracked down the airway leading to this nodule. Um, again, the point is planning. We have tools that solve certain problems, but not all problems. Next slide. Using linear EBIS, a great tool for staging the mediastinum. Can you use it for lung parenchymal lesions? Well, you can. Again, it only solves certain problems, maybe inner third nodules. In this, uh, in this example, there's a left lower lobe lung nodule adjacent to the basal trunk uh, bronchus. We could visualize a nodule you see on the top left. In the middle, you see lung sliding, so we had to skirt away from that to sample the nodule. But again, a yet a different tool to solve a different problem. But again, it's not solving all of the cases of that particular problem. Next slide. Um, maybe a thinner linear EBIS scope can help solve that. Maybe, um, it's a little bit more flexible, it's clearly thinner. Maybe this will help solve some more of the middle third. But as Dr. Kreiner just pointed out, our problem really is in the outer third, as well as some of those tough to access parenchymal anatomic locations. And thus far, we don't really have that solution with what I've outlined uh, so far in these slides. Next uh, slide. There's some tricks up our sleeve, either, either an advanced bronchoscopist or a gastroenterologist can slip the scope down the esophagus and find parenchymal lesions that happen to be abutting the esophagus. Again, we're now piecemealing things to solve a problem. Next slide. <clears throat> and that's the point here. So these are the factors that are needed to improve conventional bronchoscopy. I put some in yellow, some, or whatever color that is, some in green, and you can see it's a hodgepodge of solutions, and none of them are all that great. They're complementary, which is nice to say we have a full armamentarium, but we're really still not solving the problem. In the end, all of what I outlined has a very modest diagnostic yield. I didn't go into electromagnetic navigation as that was outlined already in the earlier slides. Next slide. So where have we come to? So on the left, we have thin bronchoscopy, uh, which I showed you one example of. Then you can, then moving into electromagnetic navigation in its sort of earliest generation using still a conventional bronchoscope, larger size scope to accommodate that EM tool, which then has to be sort of manually driven based upon the navigation platform. And we've already seen this pretty modest uh, diagnostic yield. Moving on to uh, sort of a first generation robotic assisted uh, bronchoscopy platform, which also uses electromagnetic navigation, still have a fairly sizable scope and the problems of electromagnetics uh, that come with that, um, which as many of you may know, whether you've performed it or not, uh, implies a few things. You need to map the patient ahead of time. You need to make sure there's no other interference for that electromagnetic system. Uh, pacemakers, defibrillators might be a problem. 
Um, and then when you're navigating to the lesion using conventional fluoroscopy will interfere. That's a big, big hunk of metal coming in your way. So there's a lot of interference for uh, any electromagnetic navigation platform. So moving on to uh, where we, what we have today to talk about is shape sensing robotic assisted bronchoscopy, a much smaller device. Uh, and we're gonna go into more detail, which does not require electromagnetics. Um, <clears throat> and we'll go into why, next slide. So this is shape sensing technology. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more. On the left here, you see the, the console. The smaller one is what the, the, um, the operator uses during the procedure, and the, the larger one is the actual system with your displays and the robotic arm. Um, what you see dangling there sort of in the middle is your catheter and vision probe that gets inserted into the endotracheal tube. This is after you've created a plan using a thin cut uh, CAT scan. Uh, on the right, you see the console with, with the uh, operator's hands on them. Um, and then the actual catheter itself, which we're gonna to come to in a moment. Next slide. So what is shape sensing technology? So fiber optic fibers, um, these can be tracked in three dimensions, as you can see in the video here to the right. So this uh, person is moving the catheter around, you see in real time, it's being tracked by the computer. And towards the end of this video, uh, the, the axis will change. You see this is actually happening in three dimensions, not two dimensions. These fibers can be embedded in any device, single fiber, multiple fiber, to, um, to um, track that particular device. In the case of a bronchoscopy or in, in this system, it's the catheter itself. Again, no electromagnetic field is required. Um, and that tracking is maintained throughout the, the procedure. Even if you wheel in a fluoroscopy or another tool, it will not get thrown off. <clears throat> Uh, and it's the full length of the, of the device. And now you can see it happening in three dimensions. It's the full length of the device. So if we can go to uh, the next slide, the fiber is embedded through the length of the catheter. Um, uh, sorry, uh, what I was about to say is on the next slide actually. So the catheter itself uh, is fully articulating is three and a half millimeter outer diameter with a two millimeter working channel. So small outer diameter helps you reach far and gives you a robust working channel for biopsies. This thing articulates in 180 degrees to allow you to make all the terms that, uh, turns that you need. Next slide. So uh, this is what I, I was referencing. It's the full length of the catheter that is recognized, not just the tip. Uh, so that allows, and you can see the fiber sort of being uh, drawn into that uh, representation of the catheter. Next slide. All right, so now we can drive the catheter with a lot of precision. Uh, we talked about that it's 180 degrees in any uh, direction. We'll talk about what radius are, is our limit for biopsies, but the needle uh, that comes with the system that you can purchase with the system uh, is quite flexible in all sizes, 1921 and 23 gauge, it remains flexible. We're gonna talk about the biopsy marker later during the case, next slide. Uh, so mobile 3D fluoroscopy is not a requirement for really any of the systems we're talking about. This is an example of what can be done to augment uh, in certain situations. So as a mobile system provides 3D fluoroscopy, um, sort of cone beam CT-like images, spins around the patient to obtain those fluoro images. Uh, and we'll go through a couple of cases later. Next slide. So you can see two sort of uh, just sort of perfect cases where we didn't actually require the 3D fluoroscopy. It was used to just confirm, uh, maybe appease uh, our, our own psychiatric illnesses. By using the ION system, we're able to navigate out based upon our plan, get to the nodule on, based upon the navigation, drop in the needle, and then we did the 3D spin to run the fluoro. And you can see in both cases, you see the crosshairs here in axial, chronal, and sagittal cuts that the needle is smack dab in the middle of the nodule. So in these two cases, we only use a 3D fluoro to really appease our cells, but the navigation hit the nail on the head. Next slide. So uh, just sort of shifting gears here in my last slide here for this uh, intro, are the anesthesia considerations. Much like anything that we do, we, we don't want the, anything we do for navigation or guided bronchoscopy, uh, what we don't want is the real life patient's lungs to be a mismatch with the CAT scan. So that CT to body divergence issue will be discussed later, but how can we try and minimize that? So you got to work with your anesthesiologist using a large endotracheal tube to minimize any obstruction from the device, muscle paralysis, reduce FiO2 to minimize resorptive uh, atelectasis, a good chunk of PEEP, uh, tidal volumes in the range of 10 cc's per kilo, and some are using up to 15 cc's per kilo, 
uh, ideal body weight for uh, obese patients just to make sure we're maximizing lung expansion and again, mimicking uh, your CAT scan. A few other tricks uh, that you could work on with your anesthesiologist are here on the uh, pressure release valve, uh, a range that's recommended there to try and sort of maintain positive airway pressure, doing breath hold maneuvers at certain points during either imaging or sampling, uh, recruitment maneuvers, which you could work on with your, with your um, anesthesiologist. And some places are doing pre-op incentive spirometry and bronchodilators to try and maximize that. There's a lot of different tricks. You learn more as you're going along, but these are just some of them from the anesthesia perspective. Uh, next slide. I'd like to introduce myself. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to go into a few cases to highlight um, some of the uh, 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 examples from our early experience. Uh, to date, as of a couple of hours ago, we've done 171 cases in just under a year, and that's about 200 uh, lesions. Um, so I want to go through a few cases to highlight that. So this is the first case. This is a patient that has multiple myeloma being treated at an outside hospital who on an annual surveillance PET scan was found to have a right middle lobe nodule, which you could see uh, anteriorly there towards the, the base of the lung. Sort of modest or cheap SUV. There was also a hyalur lymph node. At the outside institution, he had a percutaneous needle biopsy, which we could argue if that was the right first procedure at all, it should have, maybe should have been the lymph node, but regardless, that was what was done. And it was non-diagnostic. So uh, the patient's uh, nephew is an interventional pulmonologist somewhere else in the country and called me to see the patient. So he came to see me to consider a, a, an EBIS of the right hyalur lymph node. Uh, but we said, sure, we could do that, but why don't we sample the lung nodule at the same time? So next slide, please. So we uh, planned this on the ion system and I warned the patient that, look, I don't see a leading bronchus or some other features that are so, sort of favorable uh, to do this, but I think it's fair to give it a shot, it's low risk. Uh, and we did it and sort of the first drive out there, uh, we were right in the nodule. Um, and the biopsy showed non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. So that was very rewarding. Um, and the lymph node was um, benign as well. So the point of this case is a couple of things. One is you'll be referred uh, patients for a lymph node, uh, but actually there's a lung nodule as well, and you may be able to do both in the same procedure. Um, because of the reasons I outlined earlier from the anesthesia perspective, we sort of flip things on their head. You may want to do the lung nodule first, as opposed to the lymph node first, to sort of maximize um, the patient characteristics intraoperatively um, so you don't have ongoing atelectasis while you're staging the mediastinum. So it's a little bit different than before where we used to say stage the mediastinum if you have a, you know, maybe a, an N3 lymph node that's positive and adequate for molecular, then you may not need to sample the lung nodule. That's a little bit tougher now um, because you want to optimize your peripheral bronchoscopy first. The second thing I want to highlight here is you don't always need the perfect CAT scan. Uh, you, need, you need a good plan. So like I said earlier, spend time with the CAT scan and we won't look at it now, but there was a blood vessel reading, leading right to the nodule. So I figured there must be a bronchus there too. And I, I made a fake plan, which is um, why you see on the right here, um, the uh, biopsies, which are those little harpoons in the sort of middle of the image below the green line. Those harpoons are not going into the blue target because I made a completely fake pathway and figured I'll, um, I'll, I'll trust uh, my ability to drive in the bronchus. So trust your, your plan and your, more importantly, trust your time spent with the CAT scan. I can't say that enough. Next slide. So that was one of maybe it's in the lymph node. This is one maybe that it's definitely in the lymph node. This is a patient I've been following for about nine years who has laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma or used to with NED from that. I file for waxing and waning pulmonary nodules. Now, out of nowhere, has a large left upper lobe lung mass, which you cannot see on this slide, and some AP window lymphadenopathy. And what you could see um, is there's a, there's a bronchus adjacent to the AP window lymph node, and just proximal to that, you see a contrast-filled vessel. Uh, so bear that in mind as we go through the, the next slide. So using the uh, planning software, we plan both the lung mass as well as the mediastinal lymph node. We did the lung mass. Um, because that was a sort of a straight shot. And I wanted to make sure we got something settled before I went probably where I shouldn't be going. Um, and we, we planned the AP window lymph node. And um, you could see again where the biopsy markers are on the image sort of below the green line. We're just catching the blue target. And that was intentional. 
Um, what we ended up doing was a couple of things. We drove and we were staring straight, straight at the lymph node. Uh, all the way to the bottom right of the image, you see a tip bend radius of seven uh, millimeters, which is super tight. Um, Jeff, if you're on the call, you could, you could yell at me later. Uh, we didn't break anything. Um, but we had to adjust to make sure we can make the turn with our biopsy tools. And also that blood vessel that I mentioned, I wanted to be sure that I skirted it with my biopsy tool, which is why I skirted to the side of the lesion. And you could see on the left here, we were able to get carcinoma. So you can stage um, certain mediastinal lymph nodes that you cannot get with linear EBIS as well. Again, all in the same sitting. Next case, or next slide. So uh, I call this one just a bit outside. So uh, if there are any Bob Euchre fans out there, you'll get my reference. This is a patient with rectal carcinoma who, who showed up to IR for an outpatient biopsy of that right lower lobe lung nodule, and she showed up hypoxic, um, probably in the setting of her emphysema, nothing to do with this nodule. So she was admitted, uh, and they called us to do an EBIS of the lymph nodes, figuring that was a, the lowest risk procedure um, given the hypoxia. Well, no one really was concerned about the lymph nodes. They were probably reactive. So we said, sure, we'll do the lymph nodes, but while we're there, we'll do the lung nodule as well, because that was a preferred clinical target. Next slide. So I call this just a bit outside because we were saying hello to the chest wall. So on the left, we navigated, we identified uh, the uh, lesion under navigation, and you can see we have an eccentric view of the nodule. Uh, we made some adjustments. I didn't put the picture there and then had a concentric view. Uh, and then on the right, we passed the needle, which is the bottom right image. And you could probably tell it's going a little bit further than where the radial EBIS probe was. So that's an operator error. Um, and then on on the, the 3D spin on the top right image, you could see it's past the ribs in the chest wall. No pneumothorax, but I highlight this uh, next slide for two reasons. One, pay attention to what you're doing. And two, you see the blue part of the fluoro. This is a, a fluoro capture mode where you could say, where was I in the last fluoro? So I could use that as a reference point for my next steps. So that blue is where the needle was. And then I adjusted the drive because like I said, I didn't pay attention. Uh, before I put in that needle. We adjusted concentric view, got, got the needle in on the 3D fluoro, um, and we got a diagnosis, and she went off to SBRT. It was not a metastatic lesion. It was a new uh, primary lung cancer. Uh, so again, the operator matters too. Don't, don't trust uh, all of the systems. I'm not trying to denigrate any systems that are out there, but the operator has to do something. This is the same thing I said about 10 years ago for electromagnetic navigation. Don't trust the system, trust yourself but yourself has to have experience as well along with the quality system. Next slide. This is our very first case we did in October. Uh, someone who had a new incidental esophageal carcinoid staging CAT scan identified the subsolid lung nodule, went to IR. You could see on the right, the needle is probably in the lesion or close to it, a lot of hemorrhage, and then they couldn't really do much after that. And that was non-diagnostic. Next slide. Sent to us, we planned a navigation bronchoscopy with uh, the ION system. We drove out there and it was exactly what the plan defined, which was we were gonna come over the top of the nodule. We have a nice concentric view on radial EBIS. You could see the, the bronchus on the bottom right there is a little bit obliterated. Uh, next slide. So what we did is I actually steered away from it on purpose because you see the purple anatomic border on the top right just below the nodule. That purple is the fissure. I, I wanted to make sure I stayed away from it. It was just another millimeter away than uh, the distal end of the nodule. So I steered to the edge of the nodule so that I can get into the lesion. And uh, we identified uh, granulomatous inflammation and histiocytes. Uh, and this lesion about nine months later almost has disappeared. So a lot of different features that I've talked about during these various cases. And, and Dr. Kreiner is going to talk to us about a little more. Next slide. So let's... Um, uh, uh, we, we went through this already. So next slide, I'd like to introduce again, Dr. Kreiner uh, to go over his cases and his experience from Temple University. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Mohit. Next slide, please. So this is uh, one of the first cases. I think this was case number three that we did. We've done about 40 cases so far. We uh, first started in January and then we were delayed by COVID from, uh, we got hit fairly hard between um, March through uh, the end of May. So this is one of the first three uh, cases that we did. This 62 year old female, she's a prior smoker, diagnosed 
However, about four years ago with stage 2A T2NOMX breast cancer, and you can see the uh, characteristics of that. She underwent lumpectomy. She had adjuvant uh, XRT and was on Arimidex. And in follow-up, her um, oncologist found an incidental left upper lobe, 13 by 12 GGO, identified on HRCT. And it was done as part of an observational CAT scan done on a clinical trial. And it had faint PET positive SUV of about 1.8 here. I think you can barely see on the image down to the right. Next slide. And then we planned it. As Mo had said, planning is important. We uh, did uh, a CT spin with our cone beam CT and uh, created an augmented uh, target on our augmented fluoroscopy, as you can see that blue target on the uh, chest uh, image to the, to the left. And what we found on our navigation at about the seventh generation, we found this uh, upper lobe branch of the pulmonary artery with a lesion that was dead ahead. Next slide. And this uh, vessel was, we could see a pulsating, and I'll show you that in a minute, this 10 o'clock position. And so what we did eventually, we kept going and steered up to the lesion by itself and used a, uh, a needle biopsy to diagnose this adenocarcinoma. Next slide. And this is the movie, Abby, if you can uh, start it. And this is something where you can see with very good optics, optics where you are overall and could make a diagnosis of a lesion which is straight ahead and avoid the blood vessel. And this patient, there was uh, really no blood at all. She was discharged at home post-procedure about two hours after we were done. Next slide. So this ended up being adenocarcinoma of the lung and she was treated with SBRT um, and the patient did well. So in this case, using the optics and your planning before, you had great fidelity in knowing where you could go with a smaller lumen of the ion uh, catheter that you can get right up to the lesion by itself and see where we were going. Next slide. So this is one of the other first cases that we had. This is a 74-year-old year -old female. She had upper lobe predominant emphysema. She was referred to us for bronchoscopic lung reduction. And you can see this right upper lobe anterior lesion, 12 by 11 by 10 millimeter solid nodule. This was PET avid at 7.8. She wasn't a candidate for TTNA due to the advanced emphysema for fears of causing a complicated pneumothorax. It was pretty out, far out in the periphery and somewhat angulated, a seventh to eighth generation airway. You can see the PET uh, scan down at the bottom right. Next slide. And this is, uh, as we planned it, you can see to the left that this was a fairly articulated lesion in the anterior segment that we had to go apically and then turn down. You can see that uh, the anatomy border was far away. But when you look at the radial EBUS image shown down at the bottom left, you can see that we're somewhat eccentric to the lesion. And that's one of the good things about using this platform is you'll see where your navigational catheter and target is to the top you'll be able to feed in your radial EBUS as well as your fluoro images. So in one snapshot, you can visually see where you are and where you might need to go to be able to be a uh, concentric view. To the top right, you can see with the radial EBUS that we were able to rotate it about two degrees. And we had now a lesion that was eccentric before and now is concentric overall. And we did a cluster biopsy, a cloud biopsy, as you can see to the right, where you can mark each pass with the needle so we could basically map out the lesion and make sure we per, uh, biopsy the whole um, extent of the lesion overall in its, uh, its, in its entirety. Next, next slide. So we ended up with a diagnosis at ROSE of squamous cell carcinoma. The patient ended up having robotic-assisted thoroscopic resection plus LVRS and complete mediastinal node dissection. And she ended up being PT1B and had a um, improvement of her lung function post resection for her lung cancer rather than any detriment. She improved her lung function by about 12% uh, overall uh, with removing the emphysematous tissue. So she was quite fortunate. Next uh, slide. This is a third example. This is a patient uh, who had a lot of medical comorbidities. She was, uh, had moderate emphysema and airways as well as emphysema phenotype. She had HPEF overall. 
She was overweight, she had sleep apnea, and she was found on uh, screening CT to have this 11 by 12 uh, right middle lobe subpleural nodule that wasn't a candidate for TTNA and wasn't a candidate for surgical resection because of her comorbid clinical condition. You can see the location of this is somewhat tenuous by the right heart border, and she was on four to six liters of oxygen with exertion. Next slide. So in this case, it was somewhat challenging because of the obesity. You can see the cone beam uh, CT image with augmented fluoro target uh, after we did the segmentation. And we did the maneuvers that uh, Mohit uh, reviewed earlier about using a higher tidal line. We gave her 10 mLs per kilogram. We had her on 10 centimeters of water a peep. And we were able to decrease her FiO2 to about 38% during the case to minimize the development of atelectasis. But even with doing that, you can see the fluoro image to the right. She had significant atelectasis during the case that developed overall. Next slide. And this is the value of the navigational target and actually the pre-planning by looking at your CAT scan overall. We ended up to, in this case that the augmented fluoro image was somewhat off during the development of atelectasis during the case than what the ion planning software was during the case by itself. And we were able to manipulate with using the ion plan platform with using radial eBus to get a concentric view in the bottom left that we saw that was somewhat off of our fluoro image. So fine adjustments allowed us to overcome the CT body diversion by using a combination of our planning software and our radial eBus to come to the right, um, the right location. Next slide. So this patient was diagnosed with, during the, our case, with stage 1A, clinical stage, inoperable adenocarcinoma of the lung, and she underwent SBRT. So in this case, uh, we learned a lot by the pre-planning software, but also sometimes your cone beam CT isn't the final answer for this, and using your planning software and using radial eBus can allow you to make the uh, correct diagnosis. So that's all I had, George. Back to you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kreiner and Dr. Chawla, uh, for uh, this uh, wonderful discussion. So we have uh, a lot of questions coming in. I'm really glad that we have about 20 minutes to address all of these questions. Uh, the questions are largely divided into uh, uh, three major categories. One of them is more technical. Uh, the other one is more involved in uh, practice, uh, how to implement this. And then the, and then the final uh, question is more about comparative. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, address the technical uh, uh, questions first um, uh, with the panelists. So uh, uh, one of the major, one of the first questions came uh, came through was, uh, what is the minimum requirement for the pre-op CT scan in terms of resolution? Um, and and I stress uh, the minimum requirement. Uh, and if you guys can also, if you can also comment on uh, what is your practice and what is the most optimal uh, requirement. Gerard, do you want to take it first? And I, I could answer as well. Yeah, I can tell you what we do. It's 1.25 millimeter slice overall. We do inspiratory and expiratory <coughs> CT scans on everyone to get better fidelity. We also do the scans about 20 minutes after patients receive the bronchodilator treatment to get better scan quality. And in some cases, if this is a case that's done at Temple Radiology, we try to use uh, cuts that are about 0.75 overall. Yeah, uh, I would agree that 1.25 is probably your bare minimum. We use uh, 0.625, uh, which we've used uh, for many years uh, just for navigation overall. And um, uh, we're, we're, not as, uh, we're not as slick with the bronchodilator approach. I like that. And we, we, never, we didn't think of using the expiratory images. Um, uh, do, you, do you mind commenting on how you utilize the expiratory images uh, to, to enhance this? Yeah. That somewhat helps to look for the degree of air trapping and airways disease and gives you like any kind of um, directional change in what you might expect over the course of, of, of the respiratory cycle while you're doing the case and how much CT to body divergence you may see or encounter. Yeah, that, that's a great technique. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, especially now you have a, a planning uh, CT and, uh, and a, uh, in the same time a dynamic evaluation of uh, uh, expiratory phase. 
um, potentially accounting for some of the CT to body divergence uh, issues. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, recommendations from the CT scan uh, parameters, uh, the uh, recommendation that comes with the system uh, recommends a, a slice spacing between 0 0.5 millimeters to 0 0.8 millimeters, anywhere between that. And the slice thickness should be uh, 0 0.5 millimeters to one millimeters. Um, so I think we're all hearing uh, about the same things in terms of uh, uh, the slice thickness. Um, another question uh, uh, that came through uh, was um, uh, what is the um, uh, what's the size of the ion um, uh, robotic system uh, as compared to the pediatric bronchoscope? Uh, and if you guys can comment also in terms of size difference uh, between the uh, different uh, uh, robotic platforms, that'd be uh, great. Yeah, um, I, I could definitely verbalize it. Uh, Abby, are you able to throw up that slide that has all the different scopes on there? Uh, with the numbers, just so people could visualize it. Um, the, the ion is three and a half millimeters outer diameter, um, while a uh, P190 scope or a pediatric scope is 4.2. So this is smaller than a pediatric uh, scope, at least the, the P190 from Olympus, with the same size working channel. Uh, while the, um, it's lower down in my slides, uh, while the Monarch system is six millimeters outer diameter, Fairly similar, uh, fairly, fairly similar to a 1T scope, which is 6.2. Um, the, the, coming back to the Monarch, that's, there's a sheath and then the scope inside. Uh, so the sheath is 6 and the scope is 4.4, also uh, giving the um, roughly a 2.1 millimeter working channel. Uh, sorry, not this one. Uh, that's okay. We, it, it's, um, I don't know if we're sharing any of this content, but um, we could put it back on the screen later. It's, it's sort of halfway yeah. through my talk, Abby. Yeah. So, um, so great. So the uh, uh, the uh, the next question that uh, came through was, what is the learning curve for the robotics? Uh, and, uh, especially for someone who's used to uh, performing on uh, EMB with a uh, with current platform like Baron or Super D. And what are the challenges of incorporating a robotic bronchi or clinical study? Uh, uh, Dr. Kreiner, Dr. Shala. You know, give some uh, kind of like recommendations because uh, I'm not someone who's an interventional pulmonologist trained. I'm just somebody who's done a lot of bronchoscopy as a general pulmonologist overall. And to me, the major challenge in the learning curve was where to position all the equipment in the room to make sure you had easy access to it. And, you know, that took about two to three cases that have your workflow in to um, have your bronchoscopy tower and clean out the airway and where were you gonna position it so you could go back and get the radial e-bus and where the anesthesiologist was and how big is your cone being set up and then bringing the robot in to make sure it could all fit seamlessly when you're doing it and then have your workstation behind you to prepare your slides and materials and hand you things and then have a rose set up in the room. So that took more planning, um, which after a while, it's nonsensical how it needs to flow overall than really actually doing the procedure by itself, which was fairly, you know, it's like riding a horse. If you've ridden them before, you could just jump up onto it and it's uh, fairly easy. The one thing, the advantage of this overall, I think is the patient advantage. The time under anesthesia to get a correct diagnosis and do it safely, I found is the biggest advantage for the patient. It took some cases that could take us 90 minutes and brought it down to about 30, 35 minutes overall. And then you do your linear e-bus at the end. So the big advantage is the time and the time under general anesthesia for the patient and the safety of it. Yeah, I, I, I'd echo everything uh, that you just said. Um, and the only thing I'd add to that is you could consider if you had not have not done any navigation at all, um, and uh, you know, are not used to sort of having multiple pieces of equipment in the room, it'll probably be valuable to do some sort of a walkthrough, you know, wheel and everything, have all the staff there and just sort of visualize it uh, in the room. I think that would be helpful too. Um, but much like the procedure, starting a program is gonna require you know, a reasonable amount of planning, working with um, your bronchoscopy staff, whether it's uh, nursing or respiratory therapy, anesthesia staff, 
making sure you have your supplies and all that kind of thing. Intuitive offers a great program to help you uh, get up and running from not just a logistical standpoint, but also a training standpoint. All, all of that is uh, key. In terms of number of cases, I, I can't say I have a specific number of cases um, that I could report back from my experience. We've been doing navigation and guided bronchoscopy for a while. So this was more about learning the very specifics of this technology, not learning the, the overall um, issues related to peripheral bronchoscopy, which is a beast of, in of itself. Uh, uh, along the same lines, um, uh, if, uh, if, uh, uh, could you comment on the use um, of ION, uh, the advantages uh, over some of the EMB technology that we have right now, say Varin and Super D? Um, uh, uh, are there any advantages from your experience? So I'll re-highlight uh, one thing that I mentioned in my talk is that the, the actual technology itself, that being shape sensing versus the electromagnetic. Um, so uh, the electromagnetic uh, can, can be disruptive in a variety of different ways, mapping, getting them lined up on the table perfectly right, um, disruption from things like fluoro, concerns related to defibrillators, pacemakers, uh, and so on and so forth. The, the other thing is that uh, generally these are tip-based um, technologies, meaning that really you can only identify where the tip is rather uh, than the whole catheter, which we see here in shape sensing, which is, uh, it's, it's real time as I showed you in that video where that uh, person was sort of twiddling around that catheter. You see it in real time and in all three dimensions, which I think adds a lot of fidelity to the navigation and the, ac the, the, the precision related to the navigation itself. Uh, and we already just went through the size of the mm -hmm. device. I think that makes a big difference too. Yeah, I think, um, George, from, from my experience overall, comparing it to using, you know, steerable bronchoscopes, even including the ultra thin that we have, the ability to go out to the seventh and eighth generation routinely, find lesions that are eight to nine millimeters, some of them GGOs, which everyone knows how difficult those are to be able to locate, even with using radio e-bus, and in highly articulated segments in disease lung, like that case I showed you with emphysema. The ability to use a smaller catheter that's steerable is shape sensing, so it's relatively smooth and atraumatic to the tissue, and they can hold its shape and then manipulate it by two or three degrees and perform multiple biopsies. That's what I see as the advantage of this. That's why I think technology like this will be disruptive to how we diagnose and eventually treat lung nodules that are cancerous. So, uh, so one of the questions that came through is exactly uh, uh, talking about these type of precision, um, uh, the increased precision that we, uh, we, uh, we can obtain with the robotic platform. So can you talk about how you're able to uh, uh, obtain a concentric radio EBA signal from lesions in the lung parenchyma uh, by using this type of precision technique? Yeah, Sorry, I, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Challenging when it's outside the airway wall, uh, but you can uh, bend the tissue a little bit to get a better view. And like Mohit showed in his cases, you might have not, you never plan just one pathway. You try to plan at least three or four pathways. At least I try to do to go, in one case, went above the vessel and bend down to go on top of the lesion. The other thing that you can do is you can perforate the airway and you can put your radial e bus probe through the airway to get a better picture of the lesion while you're biopsying. And Mohit, I'm sorry I cut you off. No, no, not, not at all. Uh, that, that last point was the key one that I want to highlight. You could sort of create uh, your access point uh, in terms of a leading, effectively a quote unquote leading bronchus. Um, and uh, if you have a lesion that's not in contact with the bronchus, you may not, you simply may not get uh, a quality radial EBUS image and that we have to accept the limitation of that technology. But with the navigation, um, you'll be able to define the angle that you need to take out of the bronchus and the distance to the lesion, uh, as well as the outer limit of that lesion, um, uh, so that you can access it. Yeah, this, uh, this, this obviously leads up to the next question, uh, which people are asking, uh, what are your, anecdotally, what are your uh, diagnostic yield uh, with a robotic system, and, and how are you achieving that, meaning what type of tools are you using? 
we're we're using everything. Uh, we've only used brush a few times, to be to be honest, only because we're happy with uh, the flexibility of the needle and uh, the abilities that it provides. So um, we use needle across all the cases, uh, and we use forceps in probably in half to two thirds, depends on the operator, probably is what it boils down to. Um, and then certain cases, uh, we wouldn't use it if we're a little bit too close to say a blood vessel, uh, or in my case, or from in the chest wall. Uh, there are certain times you're just not going to use the forceps. Um, the, uh, what we don't know yet, but we're going to looking at what our ability to get molecular and next generation sequencing. It, it seems promising, but I don't have any numbers to report back. We're actively looking at that now. Um, I think someone uh, is going to ask, probably going to ask about number of passes and adequacy. Um, so we could come to that if that's a later topic, but uh, in terms of molecular, um, I don't have an answer just yet, but it seems like we have some promise. Yeah, our experience has been somewhat to the range of diagnostic tools and the reasons for it that Mohit just outlined. And as far as results so far, it's kind of like um, describing your batting average in spring training. Um, so we you know, <laughs> don't know that you can say much if you're following patients that you're suspecting with cancer or not. Some of them are benign in the first six months in a low number of cases. And low number for me is about 40 cases that we've done. But using all modalities, we're about a 90, 92% range of getting tissue that's conf uh, confirmatory of the diagnosis, whether it's malignant or benign, such as a granuloma and the patient grows out MAC or something like that we're comfortable with. But the caution is, is these patients aren't followed out traditionally to what one would use through the ACQUIRE registry for a significant amount of time. That's um, two baseball yeah. references so far. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Great. Um, so, uh, so uh, obviously, we now are uh, seeing uh, potential to getting an uh, accurate diagnosis um, with uh, smaller nodules in the periphery, outer third of the lung. This obviously brings up about what does the future hold for uh, for us uh, as a, a bronchoscopist, interventional pulmonologist, or advanced bronchoscopist. Um, uh, and uh, one of the um, uh, listeners is uh, very interested to hear your thoughts about future of navigation and the possibility of ablation. Um, so thoughts? Yeah, uh, sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, sort of simple answer, um, not a simple problem, simple answer, that being yes. Um, now that we are showing we can get to lesions that have been either more difficult to get to or get to the quote unquote easy lesions either faster or with higher accuracy and precision, we have to start thinking about the next step. So um, if, if we walk out of this technology with a 75% diagnostic yield, we shouldn't be talking about therapeutics, but if we're talking about numbers like you just heard in the 90 plus range for diagnostic yield, then therapeutics is a discussion point. Um, and I think that's sort of self-explanatory. If, you, if you're not in the lesion reliably, then you shouldn't be ablating it or doing something to the lesion. It can cause more harm than good, whether it's true harm and complications such as bleeding or pneumothorax or harm in the sense that you actually did not treat the lesion. That's, that's its own kind of complication. Uh, so yeah, I think the future of this technology uh, is ablation. Yeah. So just to follow up with Mohit said, I think there's still some challenges that, that exist. I think that the awareness of CT to body diversion um, is an issue. In the case I showed, it even happened during the case with real-time imaging. So I think um, a better approach to that or a recognition or better like planning software, just like we, we saw with our case with um, the planning software from ION, um, that might be a further enhancement. We need better tools, I think, to be able to diagnose and get adequate samples. And besides ablative therapies, I think we need to be a little bit more bold. I think in the future, perhaps we'd have the tools to even, in some cases, be able to resect the nodule and the bronchiolate and use natural luminal pathways to be able to do that. So I think we should be a little bit bold and a little bit more demanding. There's a lot of smart engineers that I'm sure exist at a lot of these companies. And, you know, game's on. Let's see how we can do a better job than what we already have right now. This is very exciting to hear. Um, uh, 
And uh, uh, I'm uh, going to start transitioning us uh, to a comparative uh, component of the question and answer uh, uh, session. So um, one of the questions came through was, uh, what are the pros and cons of uh, a Monarch versus Ion, the two uh, robotic platform? Uh, Monarch has a camera at the tip, but I can imagine that a small amount of blood or mucus will render it useless uh, in the peripheral uh, bronchial tree. Uh, thoughts? Uh, Dr. Kreiner? Well, I don't have any experience with the Monarch platform myself personally, and I thought that um, Mohit's um, kind of slide outlined well the differences between the two modalities that you could see. So I'll pass it back to Mohit to talk a little bit more about that. I don't know if he has experience or not. Right. No, I don't have a uh, patient experience with Monarch. Just use it um, basically on a given day. Um, uh, I'll address maybe the camera question. Uh, it feels nice to have the camera out there throughout the procedure, but uh, what we've learned with just doing ultra thin bronchoscopy, uh, when you're staring right at the lesion with the camera, all it takes is one biopsy and a little bit of blood to get on your lens. Um, then you spend more time cleaning the lens than actually performing the procedure. Um, so there's been a few times where we've driven out or, or uh, steered out the uh, thin bronchoscope, identify the lesion and said, huh, maybe we don't need to perform the robot. And then we're cursing ourselves because we're, we got blood and mucus and edema, and then you, you can't see what you're doing any longer, and you, you have no um, system to rely on, only your camera. Um, and so we transitioned to saying, great, we could see it with the camera, we're putting the robot out anyway, and we never had to deal with blood or loss of visualization. We did the procedure, and at the end, we cleaned up any blood that might have been there. So uh, it, personally, I don't find that the camera is the game changer, as nice as it seems on the surface. The downside to the camera, other than what I just said, is that it adds a diameter uh, to the scope, which can, which obviously can uh, limit how far you can reach. <clears throat> That's great. Um, and, and also, just for the listeners out there, I think there are um, a few individuals in the country uh, that has uh, the fortunate experience of experiencing both Monarch and Ion systems. Uh, and uh, uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, um, uh, to the organization uh, organizers and uh, and also on uh, uh, ion uh, to uh, um, uh, get their contact information uh, and they can uh, provide you with additional input uh, from uh, uh, from uh, their personal experiences um, it, out of uh, uh, out of my own um, uh, uh, interest i uh, i'm uh, currently uh, thinking about uh, uh, acquiring uh, uh, this robotic bronchoscopy technology for my uh, for my institution. Um, now that obviously came to comes with a whole can of worms. Uh, what are your how, from your experience? How did you convince your institution uh, to uh, obtain this system? Number one uh, and number two, uh, how did you build that support uh, to uh, uh, to make that case uh, for your uh, uh, for not just the robotics but also getting to uh, cone beam CT access. Um, uh, Dr. Kreiner, could you comment on that? Yeah, it's a very good question and a real one. That's really the, the major thing that makes a program successful or not. Well, you know, our institution was willing to listen to the problem of lung cancer and wants to be in the forefront of doing something positive about that. And we created a program that's multidisciplinary and integrated for lung cancers uh, screening as well as you know, how to deal with the problem that we went through in the beginning, what to do with a nodule that presents to a patient. Um, so they were sensitive to the problem. They also wanted something that didn't replace the technology that we had. So we tried to integrate it with the purchases that we made before, which we talked about, right? E-Bus and Cone Beam CT. And although Cone Beam CT is very expensive, it's probably at most institutions is underutilized by certain groups. So at our institution, we have three cone beam CTs. One's used for neuro, one's used for IR, one's used for vascular surgery. And we were able to partner with our vascular surgeons to get time in their, in their suite to be able to use it overall. So I think that probably exists at most institutions overall, to be able to partner with other people that already have a unit to get your feet wet and then maybe move on as the case volume builds to make a claim that you need your own. Keeping the downstream revenue is important. These are cases that otherwise would have been followed and no diagnosis was made. 
not good for the patient, but also if you can give the patient's therapy, whether it's resection or SBRT or chemotherapy, you basically have a return on the investment for a treating facility and not lose that patient somewhere else. So I think those are the kind of like financial arguments that you have to make centered around what the patient care benefits are. Yeah, uh, from our perspective, I'm going to say it's almost exactly the same answer. Um, it was a it was a collaborative uh, request and decision from a variety of clinical services, and we had buy-in from interventional radiology uh, here, which um, you know for us uh, it, it's it's taking away from them. Um, the they do about 1,500 needle biopsies a year, so they are not starving for business. Um, and uh, moreover, they are doing these smaller, more difficult ones. So it, this was truly a competitive technology that we brought into the institution with support from our competitor. And that, that's just you know, a, a relationship that we developed over many years. Um, so that, that was a big part of it that's, I guess, unique to us. We've also been talking about it for two years before it was available. <laughs> so they, they're probably sick of hearing us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. This is, uh, this is a great, uh, great lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Kreiner, Dr. Chala, for your time and the, uh, the exciting discussion that we had. Um, and for our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. And uh, uh, we really look forward to be here with you uh, next time uh, we join. Uh, thanks again. Thanks, George. Thanks, Mohit. Thank you, everyone.